Hello, River. Good to be back together with you again. Uh, I wanted to start, have you all heard about the three-legged chicken? Old city boy was out driving in the country one day, and he's driving down the road doing about 45 miles an hour, and he looks out the window, and he sees there's a chicken running alongside the car. And he notices the chicken has three legs. He speeds up to 55. The chicken speeds right up with him. Then all of a sudden, the chicken takes off, shoots in front of him, runs off into the farmyard. So naturally, his curiosity is aroused. He drives in to the farmyard, and there stands the farmer. And, and the, the city boy says, is that your chicken? He said, yep, that's my chicken. He said, well, that chicken had three legs. Farmer said, yeah, we, we raised three-legged chickens. The city boy said, well, why do you raise three-legged chickens? He said, well, suppose you're at Sunny Dinner and you have a guest over and you want a drumstick and your wife wants a drumstick and your guest wants a drumstick. Well, we got the problem solved. We got a three-legged chicken. And so the city boy thinks about it. Well, that kind of makes sense. He says, how do they taste? The farmer says, we don't know. We haven't been able to catch one. Satan's not here to laugh, I'm sorry. The laugh track is not with us today. But let's pick up where we left off. Uh, Peter had warned the churches um, to, to stand firm. After you've suffered a little while back in verse 10, uh, the Lord himself will restore you make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And then he goes into a doxology. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. So God will supply what you need during your suffering and after your suffering. He will restore you. And now he moves to the, the very final greetings. And in verse, 13, or verse 12 he says, With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Now we pick up in verse 13. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Okay, that raises some questions. Who is she that's chosen together with us or with you? Who is the Mark that Peter's referring to? And what and where is Babylon? What's that all about? Well, most theologians, most biblical scholars agree that she refers to the church. In Greek, the word for church is feminine. So it's appropriate to refer to the church as she. And it's sort of a cryptic uh, remark. If, if, if the letter falls into the wrong hands, it, it, it guards the church a little bit. So he's referring to the church. And then Mark is John Mark. And early tradition, strong tradition, links John Mark with Peter and his gospel. Babylon, most believe, is a cryptic reference to Rome. Peter's in Rome. He's writing the letter. The church at Rome is there. It's she. So I send you greetings from Babylon uh, in order to guard the identity of the city from what she's writing. Uh, probably because of persecution that might be taking place there or the struggle that they're going through. So Paul is just, Peter is just guarding the people uh, there against Roman intrusion, against more persecution. And then he says, greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. The formal Kiss was something that the early Christians did. Uh, Paul mentions it as well. He says, greet one another with a holy kiss. It was an expression of the agape love that the church was supposed to have. But in the third century AD, it changed a little bit. The sexes were separated. Women kissed women and men kissed men. But we really don't know how old the, the formal practice of, of this holy kiss was. So Peter ends his letter with a wish that all the believers who are in Christ may experience God's peace. Peace to all of you who are in Christ, he says. 
He's not saying that we are to experience peace in all of our circumstances, that we are to experience peace in the culture around us. He's not saying that. There will be times when there is no peace. Right now, things are unsettled and, and not what we would truly call peaceful with COVID-19 and, and everything else that's taking place. The, uh, the question of having justice uh, for all people here in America. Things are, are not really peaceful uh, as far as, as how we might see it. But Peter's saying in Christ, we can have peace. We have peace because of what Christ has done for us and what Christ has done in us. We have peace with God. And peace with God is better than anything else that the world can offer. As long as we have peace with God, we are sure of what lies ahead for us, of God's plan and hope for us. We're going to continue on into 2 Peter now because the story really continues. It, it, it carries on. Um, what's happening to these people? Why does Peter write a second letter? And we're going to see, um, first of all, when we get to chapter 3, and we'll look at something else too, that, that this letter wasn't written until a number of Paul's letters had been written and were already in circulation. And apparently, many, many churches were familiar with, Maybe these letters had been gathered together already and circulated. Um, then, if the what Peter says in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. Obviously, he must be referring to 1 Peter. So then the earliest possible date for 2 Peter would be between 63 and 64 A.D., which is interesting because Paul's first letters were written in the middle 50s into the early 60s. First and second Thessalonians and Galatians were his three earliest letters. So they would have been in circulation for a while and maybe more. So why? What's the occasion? What's happening that's causing Peter to write this second letter? Well, of course, we can infer the reason for his writing based on what we read in the letter. And the immediate occasion was Peter's knowledge that his time was short. And then the second reason is that God's people were facing many dangers. Now look at chapter 1, beginning at verse 13 and read 14. I think it right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. He's saying that Christ has told him that his time is short, that he will soon die. And indeed, he dies in Rome, as tradition records. And then in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, we see the second reason. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. Not revelation, but stories they have made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. So you've got false teachers. His time is short. False teachers are coming in. He wants to get the word out to them again before he departs this earth. And as we know, sheep are prone to wonder. So Christians are prone to forget the basic truths of the faith. That's why it's so important that we stay in the word, that we stay in prayer, that we be at church, that we hear good preaching and good teaching, and that we maintain our fellowship with one another. Iron sharpens iron. We need each other. We need to remind each other to encourage one another. That's what concerns me about this whole COVID thing. People are not coming to church. Our church has been open now 
we still have space. We're maintaining six feet of separation, and we're all wearing masks. But people, it's, it's too convenient to stay at home, but we need to be with one another. With one another. So he's, he's reminding them, don't forget the basic, tr basic truths. Don't fall for false teachers. Uh, Second Peter is also a reminder of the basis for the Christian faith. Faith in Jesus is not built on myths. It's not built on clever stories. As we read back in 1 Peter, he says, testify. I, I encourage and I testify. Peter himself has experienced. He's walked with Jesus. He's heard Jesus speak and teach and preach. And he, he's essentially saying, what I am writing here is not a myth. It's not a fable. It's not a falsehood. It's, it's because we have walked with Jesus. It's not a clever story. It's based on sure revelation. Peter had heard the revelation of Christ's word. He had received revelation through the Holy Spirit. And that's what's in his letter. Now, he's also saying that a Christian's faith, our personal faith, is not a static thing. I've heard it taught before. And in fact, I used to teach us, you go up and you hit a plateau. And you stay there and then maybe, there are no plateaus in the faith. You're either going up or you're sliding back down. You're either growing or you're slowly dying. And we need to be constantly growing. We need to be in the Word. We need to be in God's presence. And continual growth gives us the assurance, the certainty that of our effectiveness and our usefulness in Christ. So he warns that Christians have to beware of false teachers. And these false teachers are denying the soon return of the Lord. And they live immoral and greedy lives. And these teachers are clever. And they claim scriptural support, support apparently, from Paul's epistles for their views on liberty. But they're perverting what Paul has to say. And they're headed for damnation, according to what Peter writes. The church is to be alert for error. We are not to uh, allow error. We are not to accept error. We must know the word of God if we are to know what error is. And we must grow in the grace and the knowledge of God. We must always be moving upward in our faith. So now let's begin with the salutation and the blessing, which is verses 1 through 4. And in verse 1 of 2 Peter says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. So, Peter identifies himself as Simon Peter. As we look at the best readings, the best manuscripts, uh, we realize that the, the word Simon is actually the Hebraic uh, word Simeon, which is Simon in the Greek. Uh, Simeon is a more difficult uh, spelling, and it's used of Peter only in Acts chapter 15. But this fact that it's listed as Simeon supports the understanding that Peter, indeed, is the author of this letter. Simeon is an old Hebrew name, and it goes back to the second son of Jacob and Leah, and it became the tribal name of one of the 12 tribes of Israel, the tribe of Simon. This, this disciple, Simeon, or Simon, also has the nickname of Cephas, and Cephas is the Greek transliteration of the Aramaic word for stone. And Petros, or Peter, is its Greek translation. So Peter means stone. And as one writer suggests, in order to, to really understand the power of the nickname as the authors and early readers of the New Testament would have understood it and, and accepted it, we should actually call him Simon Rock. 
Simon the Rock. So Peter gives a twofold identification of himself, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And we will pick up on our understanding of that in our next meeting. God bless you.